Hi, I'm Hannah Sung. And I'm Denise Balkasun. Welcome to our very first episode of our brand new podcast series. It's called Color Code, a podcast about race in Canada by the Globe and Mail. This podcast has been a long time in the making for us. Let's take it back to the winter of last year. Right. Do you remember what I said to you? You asked if I wanted to do a special project. Asked is a really (laughs) nice way of saying, I said, you really must. Um, And then I said, maybe a podcast on identity, because I don't know if Canada's ready to talk about race the way that I talk about it in my own head. (laughs) Talking about race is uncomfortable because it's very personal. If you try to address something that someone has done that strikes you as inappropriate, aka racist, a lot of the times it feels as though your entire being is being criticized. I think you're exactly right. Where we are right now, it's impossible to divorce your personal feelings and your personal identity from conversations about race. But hopefully, in some minor way, what we can do right here is move the conversation past that If we all agree that race is a social construct, it's a lived experience, we can get to maybe some more real conversations. Which is sort of what this episode is about. Today we're looking at how the concept of race emerged in Canada, specifically for Indigenous people. Obviously, Indigenous people aren't a race. There are over 600 different communities of First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people here. However... What matters to the government is whether you're a status Indian. Well, my name's Stephanie Ponglish. I'd like to introduce myself in my Indigenous language. Wase Nankwe Indigenikas. Stephanie does stand-up with the Indigenous women's comedy group Manifest Destiny's Child. And that translates to Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman. <laughs> She is Anishinaabe. She spent a lot of her childhood in her mom's home territory. It's the Waquemakong Unceded Indian Reserve on Manitoulin Island in Ontario. Both my parents are status Indians. So according to the Indian Act, I am classified as a 6-1 status Indian. (laughs) Or I guess they call it 100%. If you are a status Indian, you get a card. It can go in your wallet. It's a piece of government ID with your photo on it, just like your license or your health card. Except that it's a race card. That's right. Having status is having access to other types of resources, health care or education, going to the dentist. It gives you access to certain tax exemptions, programs and services. And most importantly, it means being entitled to live, work and be buried on your reserve. But I didn't know who exactly got that card. It was something I was born into. When I was a young girl, one of the first times I went to a powwow, I wanted to start dancing. There was something about the sound of the big drum. The sounds of the jingles on a jingle dress. And the songs that were being sung. I always knew that I was going to eventually be part of it, like it was going to be a regular part of my life, but I didn't know how I was going to get there. Her grandparents, some of them went to residential schools, some of them went to day schools. Kids there were taught not to speak in their language. A lot of this music and dancing was illegal. And so she says that her parents absorbed those messages from their parents. Like it wasn't direct messaging. Mm-hmm. It was more negativity around traditional people. My mother supported me by finding a community member who provided me with an outfit and taught me how to dance. And I would later have to find my own rides to powwows because they, they just didn't go to powwows. So she didn't learn any of those cultural skills from her own family. No. Fortunately, I met my husband, who's a singer. His dad taught him how to sing when he was a young boy. And we all like to travel together all over in North America whenever we can. So how many here have been to a powwow? Right on. Powwows to natives are kind of like prom nights to white people. (laughs) Yep. You get to dress up. You get to go out and hang out with your friends. 
And by the end of the night, you might snag and get knocked up. I did. Yeah. <laughs> so my husband is a status Indian and I'm a status Indian. So we gave birth to two status Indians. <laughs> What if they were like, Mom, look at this great person I met. And they were not a Stats <laughs> Indian. You know, one of my ideas was bring back Res Fox. It's a dating site for uh, First Nations people. But that could get touchy if you had to put, like, your status there. <laughs> yeah, status, non-status. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. To explain how Indian status and the government could affect your love life, here's Michael Etherington. From the implementation of the Indian Act up until the more important amendments in 1985. If I am a Native woman and I marry a non-Native, your children lose their status rights. Michael is the cultural counselor at the Native Canadian Centre in Toronto. His dad is a lawyer in the Yukon and his family talks about Indigenous history and policy all the time. So it was kind of hard for him when I came in saying, can I get the grade three explanation of what Indian status is? So could you give it to me? Uh, I don't know if there is a grade three explanation, but let's try for grade seven. Okay. The conversation originated pre-Confederation. So before Canada was a country. The primary relations from a colonial perspective was between the British Crown and the, the different uh, indigenous groups throughout the country. As soon as the British Crown began delegating certain lands as reserves for indigenous people, they also began saying who was indigenous enough to live on them. Even though they promised indigenous communities that they would be dealt with nation to nation. The Crown started transferring powers to upper and lower Canada. That's Ontario and Quebec today. And back when they were colonies, neither wanted Indigenous people to be separate nations with separate opinions about governance and land. So they had a challenge. How do we create a legal definition of what it means to be Indian? And so at that time, they used blood quantum. So blood quantum is the idea that you need to have a certain amount of quote-unquote Indian blood to be Indigenous. There's three tiers to it that you belonged to a specific band or a tribe that you carried uh, within your family lineage and roots. But the most important was the introduction of the patriarchal view because a lot of the identification for the status Indian or the legal Indian was aligned with the male lineage. So after the Crown came up with a legal definition of an Indian, they started to encourage voluntary enfranchisement. But wait, that sounds like a positive word. Right, so if you think about when women were not allowed to vote, what women wanted was to be enfranchised. But what it meant for an Indigenous person in the 1800s was that they became a British citizen and they were no longer a member of their Indigenous nation. So in 1867, a brand new country was born with the British North America Act. So you're starting to see Canada emerge as a country a country with an Indian problem. In 1869, they're starting to establish compulsory enfranchisement. People were enfranchised for all sorts of things, including going to university. So if you chose to go to university, you were no longer a legal Indian. It was to recognize and allow them to assimilate and transfer it into the Canadian state. It was not a position of power. And in 1876, the Canadian government introduced the Indian Act. So now with uh, the aggressive assimilation that occurred, I think the most important to really uh, get a grasp on is Section 6. Wait, we've heard the number 6 before. Right. According to the Indian Act, I am classified as a 6 one both Stephanie and Michael are status Indians. So Section 6 is what first required Indigenous people to register with the Canadian government in order to have the right to live on their ancestral land. There's another important section to highlight in terms of the conversation of Indigenous women, which is called Section 12. And in Section 12, there's a reference point that says, if I'm a Native woman and I marry a non-status man, our children and I all lose our status rights. That seems so unfair. Yeah, well, it's assigning women races based on the men that they partner with. Mm -hmm. And also, if a Native woman's husband died or abandoned her, she and her children could lose their status for that, too. 
So it seems that for women specifically, there were so many ways in which you could lose your status. And your right to live on your ancestral lands. It's very important to recognize how marginalized our Indigenous women have become over a period of time, many, many generations. So in 1985, this gross bit of sexism in the Indian Act was amended. I believe there are about 100,000 women and children who had their status reinstated. This is also when the Department of Indian and Northern Affairs created the categories under Section 6, 6-1 and 6-2. And so Stephanie and her family, they're all 6-1 Indians. But if her children have children with non-status Indians, those children are 6-2, unable to pass their status on. So 6-2 is a second-class status Indian. Yes. And the problem with that is that it starts to introduce different levels of belonging. That seems so un-Canadian. Well, that's the reality that a lot of people live with. Like, for example, Damien Lee. I grew up in the house that my grandmother bought for us on the reserve. But the point remains, when my parents pass away, there's no chance that that would come to me. Because I'm not a band member. Damien is white. When he was six months old, he was adopted by a member of the Fort William First Nation. Our community is right on the shore of Lake Superior. Like, for example, the house that I grew up in is about 20 steps from the shore of the lake. In the center of the community, kind of nestled in the mountain, there's a sugar maple stand. My mom and dad and others would go up there, collect sap, and boil it and make maple syrup, just for our own use. Into the early 80s, it was a small commercial operation. But since about that time, it hasn't been used. It's sat kind of on its own for... 25 to 30 years. So in 2014, I moved back from Peterborough to run the sugar bush. The reason we do it is to not only use the land, but to use it as a space to talk about governance and Anishinaabe law. So we talk about those things because culture on its own is just this defanged thing, and we need to emphasize them. And the sugar bush is one place that we can do that. So we do that. There's no love in blood quantum. It's a pseudoscience that measures an Indigenous person's supposed authenticity compared to a very ancient idea of what counts as an Indian. So I'm racially white. If we were to use the the terminology of blood quantum, I have 0% Indian blood in my body. I was adopted into Fort William First Nation by my dad when I was a baby. So where it affects me, currently is I'm not a status Indian, but because I've been involved in my community my whole life, I claim my family and I claim my community. And more importantly, I'm also claimed back. But at the band office level, I'm not recognized as a member of the band. So here's where we get into the difference between being a status Indian and being a band member. The Indian Act legislated the idea of both a band and a band council. The band is all of the Indians living on a reserve. A band council replaced traditional governments with an elected chief. So today, band councils are the only form of reserve government that Canada recognizes. In 1985, the government also said that bands can determine their own membership separate from status if they want to. Most bands use Indian status as the way to determine their membership the number of status Indians on a reserve is partly how they get funding from the Department of Indian and Northern Affairs Canada, which some people shortened to INAC, which used to be the Department of Indian Affairs. All the same thing. When I was a child, I thought that I was a band member and so did my family. And it's because I was getting everything that all the other kids my age were getting, like, you know, school support and I was playing on the hockey teams. And it wasn't until I turned 19 and went to college and then submitted an application to the band for school funding that it was like, no, you're actually not a band member, so we can't fund you. Wow, imagine that had happened in my neighborhood to the next door neighbor or to me. Mm -hmm. The idea that I had not been someone who should be receiving schooling. Exactly. In 2002, I went into the band office and I said, I thought I was a band member. How do I become a band member? And at that time, they told me, you just need to apply for Indian status. 
in 2003, I sent in a list of all my family status card numbers, including my grandmother and my grandfather's. And INAC sent me a, a response saying, this is great, but you need to send us a copy of your birth certificate showing that Art McLaren is your biological father. And if you don't have that, you need to submit affidavits saying this. Now I know that INAC actually has an adoptions unit that if you write on your, your application and you say you're adopted, it goes to a completely different process. Wait, 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 wait. That's a huge level of bureaucracy and paperwork to fill out just to get to some core basic needs. How did the situation resolve for him? So before he could get around to applying for status again, he found out that's not the only way his band could make him a member. Fort Wayne First Nation did something very innovative, which is that they separated status from membership. So to be a band member today, you actually don't need status. So I've applied for membership three times in July 2012, in November 2012, and then again in uh, February 2015, no response. At that point, I was faced with, I guess, a crossroads. I don't really feel comfortable with using the Canadian legal system as a stick to make my own community accept me uh, in terms of a band membership sense, right? So I opted to uphold the code by appealing my no responses to what's called in our 1987 membership code a membership court appointed by the chief and council to deal with exactly these things. So that literally brings us up to this minute. Like, that's exactly where, where it is. I've submitted my appeal a year ago and, again, have heard nothing. At the end of the day, what I really want is the community taking care of its own business rather than always defaulting to the Indian Act controlling who belongs and who doesn't at the community. Mm -hmm. It just kind of brings me back to that word enfranchisement and the deep irony of that word. Imagine how helpless you would feel in the face of being a valued member and some outside nebulous force saying, but you can't 100% be a member. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I'll go into chief and council meetings and they'll tell me, pay attention because you're one of the future leaders of this community. In a situation similar to that, they said, we know that you belong here. We just don't know how to make this work in terms of membership. That hangover of Indian Act thinking is really what's precluding me from uh, becoming a member of my own community. Uh, I think there's I think to kind of unpack that any further actually damages it you know I don't that's it wow I mean I think I understand what he's saying I think that he's obviously frustrated with his band council but he also understands that the way the Indian Act has shaped the way indigenous people think about their own communities isn't their fault. Like, he's not blaming them for that. Just like Stephanie wasn't blaming her grandparents or her parents for being afraid of their own cultures. And who can be blamed for being pragmatic? If he's going to question that too much, I mean, where does that sense of community even go? Right. It would be obliterated. Mm -hmm. But, you know, then what are we doing, Denise? Like, we actually really do want to unpack this. That is the whole point. Right. Of trying to do a podcast where we can have these conversations that are outside of maybe our polite Canadian understanding of who we are. Mm -hmm. What have you learned about Indian status? I think the biggest thing I learned is that this piece of legislation was all about eliminating Indians on a ledger, like on paper, in order to gain access to more land, in order to gain access to more power. It's relinquishing your responsibility and gaining more power. And that is deep in the fiber of this legislation, that there is a, a racial order upon which our country was created. And also that the gross sexism, as you say, in the Indian Act, that was a function of trying to lower your responsibility towards Indian people and that women bore the brunt of that goal. Right. That was probably one of my biggest revelations working on this story. In my mind, I knew that Indigenous women were marginalized, but the concept of Indian status is connected to the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women. 
to learn as a concrete fact that for over 100 years, they were excised from their communities. Systematically. Against their will. To me, is such a clear through line to the situation that we have now that is unacceptable. It's very frustrating when you think about, you know, the crises that we are seeing in the news and the headlines every day and how slow the law is to catch up. Like legal changes are always playing catch up with society's cultural mores changing. And I mean, that change needs to be made legally. And those things take so long. It's so frustrating. But one thing that I felt hopeful about is one of the commissioners of the MMIW National Inquiry, her name is Michelle Odette. Her mother, Evelyn St. Ange, agitated for changes to specifically the marrying out clause of the Indian Act. Right. And ultimately, those changes did happen in 1985, which was a positive step. And so on the eve of the MMIW National Inquiry, you know, actually getting started, I feel like, yes, It has literally taken generations when we look at just those two women themselves, but it's moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And so it really does come back to individual Canadians who want to know about this, want to care about this, and want to hold ourselves and our country accountable. And I feel like this should be a call out to everybody who's listening to do their own reading so that we can all catch up to what Aboriginal scholars have known for ages and move forward with the work that we all need to do. Mm Mm-hmm. This week's episode was produced by us, Denise Balkasoon and Hannah Sung, with Timothy Moore and Kevin Sue. We'd like to thank our interview subjects, Stephanie Ponguish, Michael Etherington, and Damian Lee. I'd also like to thank Hayden King of the Beausoleil First Nation and Pam Palmater of the Eel River Bar First Nation for all of their help fact-checking and putting this episode together. Special thanks to all the musicians we feature in this episode, including Smoke Trail Singers, the family powwow drum group that Stephanie belongs to, and also to Bonje, the Toronto band who created the song Stumble, which is our theme song. And if you enjoyed this episode of Color Code, rate and review it on iTunes, share it with a friend, and don't forget to subscribe. We've got lots more for you in the coming weeks. We'll be discussing interracial relationships and how we as Canadians stack up when we compare ourselves to the United States. We'll be talking about AV, and if you don't know what that is, ask the closest teen, as well as what it's like to rep for your people, privilege or burden. And if you have thoughts on today's episode about Indian status, let us know what you think. Take out your phone, record a voice memo, and email it to us at colorcode at globamail.com. You can also look us up on Twitter. I'm at Hannah Sung. And I'm at Balkasun. Thanks so much for listening to Color Code.